This is Facto Rayo, a raycasting engine that works in vanilla Factorio. It can be controlled by control clicking items out of chests positioned around the screen. You can go forward, backwards, rotate clockwise, rotate anti-clockwise, strafe right, and strafe left. It's not possible to look up or down. In that way, it's very similar to early 3D games, like Wolfenstein 3D. It's not yet possible to implement Doom in this raycasting engine due to another limitation. All objects have to be the same height, but it would still be possible to render something like the TI-84 version of Doom. Despite the limitations of the engine, it also offers a lot of features. For example, the field of view can be changed. Extreme values like 360 degrees are no problem. Of course, the image is very distorted at this FOV. But we can go even further. We can change the direction of every individual ray. This can be used, for example, to introduce a blind spot. Or, if you want one side of the screen to be the mirror image of the other side, that's also possible. Or if you want to turn the screen into some sort of kaleidoscope, that's also not a problem. Another feature of the engine is collision detection. You can't simply walk through walls. And of course, objects rendered in the engine don't have to be static. They can be changed in multiple ways. For example, they can be rotated, or they can be moved, or stretched. This can even be combined with the collision detection. Even moving objects, like this companion cube, are solid. Although, as you can see, the collision detection still has room for improvement. The camera was bounced back and forth between the companion cube and the surrounding wall. And I almost forgot to show this, but the textures can also be changed. There is one genre of games that is often associated with the first-person perspective. And that is of course, the first-person shooter. That's why I've added the shoot button next to the walk forward button. Now we need something to shoot. For example, this monstrosity. It's not easy to create textures that look good with so few colors and at such a low resolution. Of course, it's not really fun if the target is simply a static object. Did I forget to add an AI to the target? Or did I forget to turn it on? No, because it's not simply an NPC. It's actually player 2. And the second player works just like the first one. It's controlled in the same way as the first player. And because the map is symmetrical, it spawns in a similar location. The second player also has collision detection. And more importantly, the second player can shoot back. The bullet didn't render correctly, that's a bug. But I'm so far in the production of this video that I'm not going to fix it. It will have to wait until the next version of the engine. Let's take a look around the map. We'll start with all the components where other people deserve some credit. First of all, we have the screen. It's based on a design by Dave MCW, but it has been modified a bit. The resolution has been lowered to 107 by 80 pixels, minus some dead pixels for substations. This was done to reduce lag. A smaller image is easier to generate than a big one. The way the image data needs to be sent to the screen has also been changed to make it more compatible with the rest of the engine. 
If you count white and black, it can display 8 colors. Next, we have the buttons. The buttons are simply squares of requester chests. Combinators detect if you take items out and bots put them back. The idea to create buttons this way came from Klebe. Up next, we have the power generation. The nuclear setup was sent to me by Hunter. And it was designed by Claudio Perico. In the end, it was overkill, so I only used one fourth of the design. Now some miscellaneous components. Here we have the logic that keeps track of who wins and resets the game. And here we have the logic that was used to animate the companion cube and the doors. Let's zoom out until we can see everything. Now the true scale of the project becomes visible. It consists out of approximately 300,000 parts. Only counting lamps and combinators. It's so big that not all the terrain in the screenshot is generated. On the right you can see the logic for player 1 and on the left the logic for player 2. And if you're viewing this video in a high resolution, you might still see the connection between the two players. Each player has 107 ray costing units. This way all the rays required for a frame can be calculated in parallel. And just below the ray costing units you can find most of the collision detection logic. If we zoom back in, we can see the logic for some very important rotations. For example, we find the circuitry responsible for rotating player movement. This makes sure that when you press forward, you actually move in the direction you are looking. We also find the logic that makes sure the enemy player model and bullets that you have shot are oriented correctly. We have arrived at the actual ray casting engine. Before we look at that, maybe it's best to explain how the ray casting works. Let's start with a top-down view of the map used in this video. Ray casting consists of sending rays from the camera and rendering on screen whatever they hit. You can think of the rays as lines of sight. Because the screen has a horizontal resolution of 107 pixels, we need 107 different rays. Each of them aimed at a slightly different angle. To actually do this, we first need a representation of our world. The world consists of a series of rectangles. The rectangles look like lines here due to the top-down perspective. Each of these rectangles can be described using five numbers. Four numbers for the X and Y coordinates for both endpoints. And another number to indicate what texture should be displayed on the rectangle. Next up, we need to move the entire world in such a way that the player ends up at coordinate 0, 0. Now, if we go back to the combinators, we can see where the X and Y coordinates end up. The fifth number is not visible from here, but will be shown later. We can also see the logic that remembers the player position, and the logic that moves the world until the player corresponds to coordinate 0, 0. On the right side, we can see the clock generator. It keeps many parts of this build synchronized. It generates a pulse every 45 game ticks. The engine also only generates an image every 45 game ticks. The footage of this video has been sped up to compensate for this. Next we need to rotate the world until the ray or line of sight corresponds to the x-axis. Now we can simplify the world a lot. Because the x-axis corresponds to our ray, we can eliminate all rectangles that do not intersect with our ray. All rectangles where both endpoints are above the x-axis, or where both endpoints are below the x-axis, will never hit our ray. And so they are not in our line of sight. If we go back to Factorio, we can see the logic that rotates the world, and the logic that simplifies the world. We also find the fifth number to describe each rectangle, the one that wasn't visible before. For our next step we need to find two properties of our rectangles. The first property is the distance from our player. We need this to figure out which rectangle is the closest, but also to figure out at what size the texture should be rendered at. Objects look smaller if they are further away. The second property we need is which part of the rectangle is hit by the ray. Textures are most often wider than a single pixel, so we need to figure out which part of the texture to show. We can figure out both of these properties from the intersection point of the rectangle with our x-axis. Although figuring this out on paper isn't hard if given enough time to think about it, it's not that simple in Factorio. 
Instead of calculating the intersection point directly, we will approximate the intersection point and then improve our approximation until it is good enough. As a first approximation, we use the midpoint between the two endpoints of the rectangle. To improve the approximation, we repeat the procedure of calculating the midpoint, but we replace one of the endpoints with the previous approximation. If the previous midpoint was above the x-axis, then we replace the endpoint that was above the x-axis. If the previous midpoint was below the x-axis, then we replace the endpoint that was below the x-axis. Each time we do this, we get closer to the actual intersection. In total, we calculate the midpoint 8 times. This might not give us the exact intersection, but this is good enough for our limited resolution. Back to Factorio. We see the logic that finds the intersection by calculating the midpoint 8 times. We also see the logic that finds the closest rectangle. This is the rectangle that we actually need to render. With this done, the ray casting part of the engine is over, and the result of the ray casting is sent to the texture units. That result consists of an identifier representing what texture needs to be drawn, the distance of this rectangle to the camera, and which part of the texture that should be drawn. But these results are for each ray, so 107 of these results are sent. This information gets sent here. Textures often have repetition in them. Take the wall texture for example. It keeps repeating. Instead of storing a giant texture, only a small part of the texture is actually stored and then repeated many times. This is the logic that does the repeating. And if a texture is symmetrical, it can be mirrored, so only half of the texture needs to be stored. And last but not least, they also filter the results so an instruction to render something only ends up at the texture unit that actually contains the texture. Now for the actual texture units. These contain the majority of all combinators of this build. The reason that they are so big is that each texture is stored multiple times. 138 times to be exact. But each copy is scaled slightly different. This way, no scaling of textures needs to be done in Factorio. The only thing that needs to be done is selecting the correct one. Different slices of a texture are stored underneath each other and different scales next to each other. And no, I wasn't crazy enough to place these all by hand. I used the script to convert images directly into a blueprint. Each group of 8 combinators contains a single slice of texture. Or, each combinator remembers the colors for 10 pixels of a texture. And lastly, here is where the game over and victory screens are stored. I hope you liked this video and if you did, consider subscribing, because many of my videos are like this one. For example, about a year and a half ago I created Pac-Man in Factorio. Thanks for watching.